My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Now, on Friday, the Indian film industry lost another of its young and bright stars to an unexpected cardiac arrest. The actor's name was Puneet Rajkumar. He was only 46 years old. He was very healthy. He was a fitness enthusiast. And he just finished at the gym and then started finding that he was complaining of intense fatigue. He was experiencing intense fatigue. And then, unfortunately, his heart went into a very fast but very ineffective heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. And as no blood was being circulated by the heart, the organs started suffocating. This included his brain. And by the time he reached hospital, it was too late, and he was unfortunately pronounced dead. Puneet leaves behind a young wife and two daughters, very much in keeping with the kind of human being he was. He had asked for his eyes to be donated in the event of his death, and his young and very brave family made sure that his wishes were respected. This is a devastating story. And all we can do is wish for strength for his family to bear such a huge loss. Today I wanted to do a video on sudden cardiac arrest and sudden death. I can understand that some may not want to watch this due to its content, but it does have some messages that may be helpful to some. I dedicate this video to Puneet, his young family, and all those that have been left bereft by his untimely demise. Sudden cardiac arrest refers to the sudden cessation of cardiac activity, which then leads to no blood being circulated around the body. This is usually due to the heart going into an abnormal heart rhythm, which results in the heart not beating at all, or the heart beating so fast that it is completely ineffective. The latter is the most common heart rhythm disturbance and is referred to as ventricular fibrillation. If cardiac activity is not restored in some way, then inevitably a sudden cardiac arrest will lead to death. And th when that happens, this is termed sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death is not uncommon. It is estimated that 15% of total mortality in the Western world can be attributed to sudden cardiac death. The risk of experiencing sudden cardiac arrest is increased by a number of factors, but there are two really important factors. The first is increasing age. As you get older, the risk goes up. And the second is underlying cardiac disease, which may be congenital or acquired, but if you have a diseased heart, then the risk goes up substantially. So increasing age and underlying cardiac disease. In general, sudden cardiac arrest is seen two to three times more commonly in men compared to women, especially at a younger age. As um, the population gets older, as uh, people get older, that uh, difference is not as uh, dramatic. But certainly amongst the younger uh, population, sudden cardiac arrest is seen more commonly in men. If there is a history of clinically recognized heart disease, so that can include congenital heart disease, angina, previous heart attacks, cardiomyopathy, heart failure, anything like that, then there is a six to tenfold increased risk of sudden cardiac death. In addition, if patients don't have heart disease, but have major risk factors for heart disease, then the risk is increased by two to fourfold. Sudden cardiac arrest is the mechanism of death in 60% of patients with known coronary artery disease, and it is the initial clinical manifestation in 15% of patients. What are the causes of cardiac arrest? Broadly speaking, the causes can be divided into four groups. Number one, and by far the commonest, 70% of all sudden cardiac arrests, sudden cardiac deaths occur because of this, and that is ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease means that for some reason, the blood supply to the heart is interrupted. So the blood that would normally supply, you know, heart muscle to make the heart work is in some way blocked. Uh, this is most commonly due to plaque in the heart arteries, so atherosclerosis, atheroma, 
uh, plaque and the uh, furring up of the heart arteries. Um, and therefore, because you get the furring up, eventually the heart blocks for uh, the, the artery blocks for some reason, blood cannot get through to the heart. Part of the heart muscle becomes deprived of oxygen rich blood. It starts suffocating. As it suffocates, part of the heart muscle dies, but also the heart can become more irritable, and that can lead to something like ventricular fibrillation, which can lead to cardiac arrest. And that can happen very quickly, even within an hour. Now, so the most common cause uh, of sudden cardiac arrest is ischemic heart disease. The most common cause of ischemic heart disease is plaque causing a blockage. However, there are other ways in which you can deprive the heart of blood without having plaque. One of them is an embolism. So you can have a blood clot which forms somewhere else in the body. And for some reason, the embolism, this blood clot moves, goes down a heart artery and causes a blockage there. So the heart artery itself may not be diseased, but this clot could go from somewhere else and get deposited into the heart artery and block the heart artery. That's called coronary artery embolism. Another uh, mechanism would be spasm, so coronary artery spasm. So uh, coronary artery spasm is a recognized phenomena where the blood vessel can go into spasm. So you can get, develop a very tight constriction, even though the vessel itself doesn't have any plaque, but the vessel becomes constricted in, for some reason, and that can then deprive the heart of blood and lead to um, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest, etc. Another way is dissection. Dissection is where um, you have the inside of the artery, the coronary artery, for some reason tears off. And when it tears off, you get a flap. So the inner layer sort of flaps down and that flap is blocking uh, blood from getting through. And that's another mechanism by which you can get ischemia, ischemia, even though you may not have plaque in your heart arteries. Then the second category, the second broad category is non-ischemic heart disease. That is much um, rarer. 10% of sudden cardiac arrests occur because of non-ischemic causes. This is where the heart itself, for some reason, is weakened or damaged due to either a congenital problem, uh, inherited cardiomyopathy, uh, something like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, valve disease of the heart, myocarditis, etc. So the arteries are fine, the heart is getting all the blood it needs, but the heart in itself is diseased. And because the heart is diseased, it can misbehave, go into funny rhythms, etc. The third group is no structural heart disease. So in these patients, when you look at the heart arteries, they look fine. When you look at the heart as a pump, the heart as a pump looks structurally normal. But some of these people can still suffer cardiac arrest. Uh, and in these people, it is thought that they have some form of electrical problem. Uh, so this includes long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, heart block, and familial sudden death. This is a very difficult group because sometimes the first time you know about it is after it's happened because there are very few tests that you can do to look for an electrical problem which hasn't already manifested before. If the patient has been completely well, you can do all the tests and you will not pick up the electrical problem. It is only after the electrical problem has manifested in some way, and hopefully if the patient has survived that, that you can then start entertaining these diagnoses. Sometimes you can tell from the ECG, etc. But generally, this is a very difficult group to try and work out. We would say that about 10 to 12 percent of patients under the age of 45 suffer cardiac arrest in the, in the presence of a structurally normal heart. Structurally normal, meaning that we've actually looked at it with whatever technology we have available at this point in time. And bearing in mind the limitations of de that technology, the arteries look okay and the, the heart function uh, looks okay and there's no valve problem, etc. And finally, there is another group which are non-cardiac causes. Here, the heart is not actually misbehaving of its own accord, but something else is making the heart misbehave. So um, a common cause is pulmonary embolism. A blood clot goes to the lung for whatever reason. Uh, there's a profound a lack of oxygen because part of the lung dies, lack of oxygen. The lack of oxygen deprives the heart, even though the heart is working well. The lack of oxygen there is, um, makes the heart muscle suffocate and the heart goes into a funny rhythm. Same with a bleed, a big catastrophic bleed in the brain. The brain is compressed because of the bleeding. The respiratory centers in the, in the brain 
uh, stop working, the patient stops breathing, blood doesn't get around, the heart gives up. Uh, other things uh, are include drowning, uh, central airways obstruction, choking, uh, and also drugs, toxins, etc. In general, in patients above the age of 35, the likeliest cause will be coronary artery disease, whereas in patients under the age of 35, it is more likely due to a congenital cause, something that the patient may have been born with, or due to one of the non-ischemic causes I've mentioned. One of the very interesting questions is, you know, someone may have the substrate, someone may have been born with something, and they may have lived for 40 odd years with that thing and nothing bad's happened. Then one day out of the blue, something like this happens. And the question then is, why on that day? Why on that particular day? Um, if you have something for 40 years and it hasn't misbehaved, why does it choose to misbehave on that day? And that is a really difficult question to answer and no one quite knows. But what we do know is that there are some triggers. So you have to have the substrate, but then there are some triggers which make the event more likely to happen at that particular time. And common triggers include ischemia. So if, for example, you have a diseased heart and then for some reason you don't get enough oxygen in, um, you know, for whatever reason, then that could trigger something to malfunction. Electrolyte disturbances, particularly low potassium levels, low magnesium levels, uh, are an important cause. Medications are a really important cause. So um, a lot of medications actually may have a pro-arrhythmic effect on the heart. And perhaps the combination of that pro-arrhythmic agent and underlying heart disease um, in combination results in something like this happening. Stress, fever, dehydration, intercurrent illness. So intercurrent illness, I mean, we've recently, you know, over the last couple of years, we've known about patients who, during the COVID pandemic, who've suddenly been found dead in their bed. They've had COVID, they were fine, and then suddenly they're found dead in their bed. And this is usually not the way COVID would behave, because COVID would cause you to become breathless, cause lung problems. But there have been reports where people have just been found dead. You know, one minute they're fine, and then they're found dead. And the question then is, in those people, maybe it is the stress presented by this extra illness that has um, unfortunately pushed them over the edge. Extreme exertion and sleep disturbances. Next thing I wanted to tackle is warning symptoms. Now, patients may get warning symptoms beforehand, but they generally tend to be mild and nonspecific, and therefore not uncommonly uh, patients uh, don't seek medical attention for them. In one particular study, 51% uh, of patients said they had some sort of mild warning within four weeks of the event. And it is estimated that up to 80% may have a warning within an hour of the event. These warnings could include chest discomfort, breathlessness, palpitation, lightheadedness, or blackouts. Usually, chest pain and breathlessness are the commonest symptoms. And certainly, if you are someone who is over the age of sort of 40 and you get chest pain, then that's an important um, symptom to address there and then. Do not leave it till the next day. Do not leave it till, you know, next week. It's important to address this because these could be warning symptoms. There are certain risk factors um, for... Uh, increased risk of sudden cardiac death. We've already mentioned age, we've already mentioned structural heart disease, but in addition, cigarette smoking is a really important risk factor. Active, active smokers are more than double, uh, the, have more than double the risk of sudden cardiac arrest compared to non-smokers. Fortunately, the risk declines rapidly once one stops smoking, and therefore this should be an incentive to everyone who smokes to try and reduce their smoking, uh, because with every cigarette you present yourself with more risk. Exercise. Now, a lot of people worry about exercise as a risk factor for sudden cardiac arrest, and certainly, you know, uh, there are lots of reports of people dropping down dead suddenly in the gym or on, um, on the football pitch, etc., 
The evidence suggests that the risk of sudden cardiac arrest is transiently increased during and up to 30 minutes of very strenuous exercise, but the actual risk is very, very low. They estimate 1 in 1.5 million episodes of exercise, so the actual risk is very low. The risk is greater during unaccustomed exercise compared to accustomed exercise. So if someone has been training a long time, they will cope a lot better than someone who hasn't trained. And that's why training is so important. And again, this should not put people off exercise because exercise reduces our risk factors for developing heart artery disease, etc. But it's just to put it in context that if you're doing a strenuous amount of exercise, then a very tiny uh, increased risk transiently. Uh, it is important, however, to note that uh, the, if you do strenuous exercise and you have underlying unrecognized heart disease, so let's say you're sitting on a significant narrowing, you don't know anything about it, and then you're putting yourself through strenuous exercise, then the risk is higher. Uh, but if you have been tested out, if you've had a heart scan, if you've had monitors, uh, if you've had an ECG and those are okay, then the risk is much, much, much lower. Family history of sudden cardiac arrest. Family history is very important, especially of young um, uh, sudden death, so people under the age of 40. Uh, a family history will almost double, almost double the risk. In addition, there are other risk factors such as smoking. So if you have a family history and you smoke, the risk can go up, up to fivefold. And I certainly feel that uh, not enough people are curious about their family history. You know, and when I see patients and I ask them about the family history, they don't really know very much. And I think everyone should try and find out as much as they can about their family history. And in particular, those people who've been told, okay, well, so-and-so died at a young age, uh, we don't know why. It's worth finding out because if it is an unexplained sudden cardiac death, then you know that family history may be relevant to you and your loved ones, and this is why it's very important to know about it. And anyone who does have a family history of sudden cardiac death or someone dying at a young age for no good reason, that should be investigated aggressively. Chronic inflammation is another risk factor for sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death. Patients with elevated CRP levels, CRP is a measure of inflammation, seem to be at a higher risk. Excessive alcohol, so if you're drinking more than six drinks a day, is a risk factor. And stress is a huge risk factor and cannot be underestimated. Um, we know that in uh, times of extreme stress like earthquakes, war, the risk or the number of sudden cardiac arrests goes up significantly. So in terms of management, the single most important thing in sudden cardiac arrest is resuscitation and electrical shock treatment, electrical cardioversion. This is why I think one of the most important things that everyone can learn is the ability to carry out CPR and deliver defibrillation safely. Uh, most places now have a defibrillator and it is vital that all employers and schools teach how to deliver safe and effective defibrillation. In fact, I think, you know, I'm amazed at how expensive uh, life support courses are because really this is education that everyone should have uh, and should be reiterated time and time again because that is how we save lives when our society are well experienced in delivering effective resuscitation. Uh, this is how we're going to make a difference to this number of patients who unfortunately succumb to sudden cardiac arrest. In terms of screening, a lot of people will say, well, you know, can I be screened to see what my risks are? In patients with an elevated risk of sudden cardiac arrest, such as patients with heart disease, screening is generally recommended. Um, in, and, and in those people, if the risk is found to be abnormally high, then either you want to treat the underlying condition or implant a defibrillator which sits on the patient and if they ever did go into ventricular fibrillation, the defibrillator would pick that up and deliver a shock, thereby saving that person's life. In the general population, it is not offered because it is generally not thought to be cost-effective in terms of identifying patients at high risk of sudden cardiac arrest. If someone came to me and said, look, you know, uh, how do I get my heart investigated, then I would certainly recommend an ECG. 
because the ECG tells us a little bit about the electrics of the heart, an echocardiogram which allows us to look at the heart and see if the heart as a pump is working, the valves are okay, etc. And then uh, ideally a cardiac CT scan which allows delineation of the heart artery so you can work out whether there is any disease in them. Uh, and finally, some kind of stress test where you actually put the patient on the treadmill and put the heart under stress and see how the patient copes. I think that would be a fairly comprehensive set of tests. The problem with this is that if your cardiac CT, for example, is normal, then that's hugely reassuring. But if it's abnormal, then somewhere there's very little you can do about that other than just lead a good lifestyle and maybe take statins even though the data for that is not great um, but uh, but so it can be a double-edged sword you know you can go through the screening if it's all normal it's great you can get on with your life think you've done the right thing if it's abnormal sometimes it's difficult to know what to do with that now, many people asked me why, despite all the tests, some people can still suffer a cardiac arrest, and there are several reasons as to why. I think as doctors, we tend to be a little limited by what we know. So if we know something, we look for the things we know, and then we disregard all the things we don't know. So uh, we have to keep our an open mind and realize that we really need to think beyond what our technology offers and try and develop new technology. We have lots of tests to study the heart, but most of them rely on the visual appearance of the heart. You know, a heart may look normal, so I scan it, it may look normal, but it may still be composed of abnormal muscle, which we may have inherited, for example. And unless we do a biopsy, take a little bit of that muscle out and study it uh, under a microscope, um, we wouldn't know. The problem is you can't do that as easily in someone who's asymptomatic uh, because doing a cardiac biopsy in itself is a risky proposition. So, so we usually you know, have to rely on non-invasive tests. And again, we have to be aware of that. There's maybe a lot of stuff that goes on in the heart that we don't pick up because our tests are reliant on a visual appearance. Also, it's worth knowing that unfortunately most of what we know about sudden cardiac arrest comes from studying survivors. The study of the dead is poorly done. I was speaking to a histopathologist who had just conducted a post-mortem on one of my patients and he was telling me that most mortems are very cursory. They're, they're, they're not detailed examinations. Largely, they're done just to exclude the possibility of foul play so that a death certificate can be issued. They're not rigorous investigations. They're not rigorous examinations. And therefore, and the question is, why is that? And that is because of a lack of time, a lack of funding in sort of those services and a lack of expertise. And unless we start investing in the study of the dead, we will not make strides in understanding sudden cardiac death. We also need to be doing a lot many more post-mortems. Some cultures, you know, unfortunately when someone dies, they, they don't want that person to go through the indignity of a post-mortem. Uh, but it is very important because only when we do most po more post-mortems will we start understanding what is going on and what has happened in those patients. This brings me to the end of a somewhat depressing video. I would say that in my 30 years in medicine, I've come to realize one thing, and that is something bad can happen to anyone at any time. No one is immune. Whilst this awareness may enslave us and fill us with fear, we can also use this awareness to liberate us into living a more fulfilling life. No one has any control over how long we will live. However, we do have control over how we choose to live. When we live in harmony with others, when we live a life of giving and compassion and simplicity and moderation uh, and spend time with our loved ones, we experience joy. And truthfully, as long as we strive to achieve this, nothing else matters. So I wish you all good health and lots of joy. All the best.